I'm going to start recording. So welcome to Math 119, 312. This is Lecture 8. And what we're going to do today is something a little bit non-standard. So I did this recently with my 400 level senior seminar where we took a research paper and we went through it. Rather than having you read the stuff beforehand, almost like you're at a conference and you're hearing a presentation, what are your thoughts? Now, this is not entirely fair because normally if you're at a conference, you will actually be working in that field. You will have a lot of background knowledge. I'm just throwing you in the deep end. So this is a paper written by one of my former students who has greatly surpassed me in terms of his statistical preparation. You know, it's like Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi. The roles are entirely reversed now. He knows far more than I do. It really puts you in a good mindset for what we're about to do. I, I am not expecting you to go through all the math line by line. What do you think I'm expecting you to look for? The big picture, exactly, the big picture. Does this seem reasonable? Can you do some smell tests? One of my favorite typos in my educational career was when I was taking thermodynamics. And you threw an ice cube in the pool and the pool froze. It had signs off in terms of which way things were going. Right? The ice cube should not freeze the pool. You can tell clearly something is wrong here. So as I go through the paper, I want you to be looking at it and asking, are these reasonable assumptions? The conclusions which follow by math or statistics, I may not be able to check all of that immediately, but can I at least say if it's reasonable or not? So I didn't realize the screen wasn't down. Okay. So the first thing is to get a little bit of a sense of what is going to be used in the analysis. They are going to be using an incredibly souped up version of Poisson distribution and Poisson model. So I am not going to go into all the details of that. If you are taking this at the 300 level, I do encourage you to look a little bit more at some of these concepts, models, and whatnot. So there are many different distributions you can have in probability. So probability assigns 100% throughout all the outcomes. And you could ask, how likely is each outcome? So if you flip a coin, what are the two possible outcomes? Heads or tails. Most of the time, what will you assume the probability of each is? About half or 50%. But it could be the case that maybe the coin is a little worn. When I was at Princeton as a graduate student, the great John Conway had a deal. If you could get to 100 points against him in backgammon, he would trade positions with you and become a grad student, and you would become a named professor. As a grad student without a PhD, this is a pretty good deal. You risk nothing. And Conway didn't play to win. He played to have interesting games. Until you started to get close to 100, in which case then you played carefully. And so no one ever got to 100 points, but I actually got up to around 60, I think, at one point, because he was more concerned about finding interesting games. Do you think I cared about the outcome of the games? I'm sorry? Yes, what do you think? What do you think I kept? What do you think I kept? We were playing all these games. What information do you think I might record? Yeah, the record. So I could actually show, no, 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 I got to 100 points. Here's the games. Right? I, I had a table. And for each game, I recorded not just who won, but who rolled first and what their initial roll was. And I noticed that on average, Conway was rolling higher than I was by a significant amount. And we were always the same color. And the die I were using, and the die he was using, were worn from age and they weren't worn equally. And so you have to be really careful about any biases that could come into play. You really want to be careful. So for probabilities, uh, the Poisson distribution is characterized by one parameter lambda, which is greater than zero. And the probability that you have k occurrences of something is lambda to the k, e to the negative k, divided by k factorial. So k factorial is the product of all the numbers 
uh, from k down, whoops, from k down to uh, one, and we define zero factorial to be one. Another way of viewing k factorial is it's the number of ways to order k objects when order matters. If you have four people, there's four choices of who's first. Now you have three people left over, three who could be second, four times three is 12, then two for the third, and finally you're forced with one person for the last. We say zero factorial is one to basically say there's only one way you can do nothing. You can't do nothing multiple ways, that would be doing something. If you look at the picture over here, this shows you what a Poisson distribution looks like for different values of the parameter. You know, for lambda equals one, lambda equals four, lambda equals 10. And the mean or the average value of the distribution is lambda. And the standard deviation is square root of lambda. So it's basically telling you fluctuations should be of size square root of lambda. There's lots of places where it occurs. So you know, Wikipedia says, uh, for one example, uh, looking at how much mail people receive on average. Other examples it gives is um, number of phone calls received by a call center per hour, the number of decay events per second in a radioactive source. You could actually look at a bunch of different items in your life and see if they follow a Poisson process. So what could you do in the 21st century that would give you good data sets? What do you think you get a lot of? I'm guessing it's not snail mail. Email. email. So you could actually look at how much email do you get? Over what time period? We're talking per second, per minute, per hour, per day, per week, per month. Okay. Per day. So if you go over too small of a time period, the fluctuations would be large enough to overwhelm. So do you think you will have maybe a Poisson distribution for email? Maybe closely centered? Do you think day of the week matters? Which days might you get more emails? Monday to Friday. Monday, why Monday? Also, some people might actually ch not check over the weekend. And so you might have a lot of emails coming in and then you might respond to them, which gets more responses. Weekend might be very different as well. If there's a holiday, very different as well. If you have a class day, you know, if you look at the number of emails I send, uh, you can tell when I'm teaching. You may not be able to tell when I have a Zoom meeting, but that's another story. You could also look at texts and see, you know, does that look personia? So I encourage you to find at least something in your life where you could do this. If you have a Fitbit, you could look at maybe number of steps. Not everything is going to be Poissonian. The number of steps might be more normally distributed. But if you are an athlete, you could have days that are very different in terms of the number of steps you do. Okay, so this is just a really nice distribution. It assigns a probability to the non-negative integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, going off to infinity. And different choices of lambda will have different shapes, but for the most part, these are called one bump distributions. They go up, they go down. And it turns out they model a lot of things. Uh, actually, there's a very important probability question that is coming up later this week about a specific day. Anybody know what I'm thinking of? Mountain day. What do you think the probability of mountain day is? Give me some range of probability. Is it 250%? Is it negative 4% for this part? It's probably higher towards the beginning of the month because there's better weather and they yeah. want to just try to have it sooner. Yeah, so a lot of it is going to depend on what the long-term forecast is. You know, if the forecast for Friday is bad, but next Friday looks good, or if next Friday looks really bad, they might decide to risk it this Friday because it's not so bad. And if next Friday is really bad, there's really no surprise if the first two Fridays aren't Mountain Day and you're coming to the third one. So it's an interesting question. Try to look up, if you can, the historical distribution of Mountain Days. You know, how often does Mountain Day fall on the first, the second, or the third? I have to be very careful because this is being recorded. 
about ways to try to find out when Mountain Day is happening. Um, of course, none of us would ever try to do anything like that. But hypothetically, if one used to be involved in, say, oh, I don't know, activities involving young kids where you might need to rent school buses, you might find out that school buses are not available on a certain day. Does that mean that that's going to be mounted? No, it could just mean that the college is being, has an insurance policy. And we just need to make sure that the buses are available. So we want you to take your buses out of circulation for these three Fridays. But you want to try to figure out what is the right probability to assign to different events. You know, Mountain Day will happen this year. I have no idea what it will be. It will be the most non-standard Mountain Day, I think, since Siberian Mountain Day, which actually turned out to be beautiful weather. Um, I will be doing something for Mountain Day. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I strongly encourage everyone to do Mountain Day, especially this year. But you need to find what do you think is the right probability model. So if Friday is not Mountain Day, I will probably do my baseball modeling lecture just to give you a sense of how you do modeling. And it will celebrate the great Red Sox season of fewer than 50 losses, which is amazing. If you told me that a year ago, I would have been very happy. Three months ago, not so much. All right. Here is the abstract from the paper. We examine the impact various policies had on the transmission of COVID-19. Many models in the literature employ linear models, few contributions, incorporate spatial analysis. What do you think spatial analysis is? I'm sorry? Like 3D, you know, how things are related to each other. And so we utilize a Poisson generalized linear model with a spatial autoregressive structure to do so. And we find that this model provides significantly more explanatory power than its non-spatial counterpart. So trying to take into account geographies. You've heard of the Purple Valley. It might not be enough to just look at municipalities, but maybe how the municipalities are related to each other, how accessible they are. Our analysis also finds the counterintuitive result. It's always interesting when you see that in the abstract, that staying at home can lead to increased disease proliferation. Does anybody know any examples where that has been reported on in the news? Or is this completely surprising? Is this the first time you're hearing it? First time you've heard of it. I did hear some of this stuff in New York City. And I'm not sure if it was increasing, but they were finding that a lot of the people who were testing positive in New York City were people who were self-isolating at home. And so you know, as soon as I see counterintuitive, that's something I'm, I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to. Additionally, we find positive effects from increased gathering at grocery stores and even small effects on visiting parks, highlighting the complexities travel and mitigation have on the transmission of diseases. What's nice is this paper has not been submitted yet. So you have an opportunity to provide feedback. So I strongly encourage you to really be thinking about this and send me suggestions that you think the author should consider or look at. You know, this is somebody who is at a think tank. And so this is somebody who is at least connected to people who have a hand in making policy decisions. And what I hope you're seeing from some of the conversations we're having throughout the semester is the data is not always clear as to what it is recommending. And this is your chance to look at something with a fresh perspective. All right, so spatial modeling provides a useful set of techniques. And so basically this is just, you know, a lot of people have used spatial modeling in the past. This is not a completely absurd thing to try to do in a situation like this. It's a very natural thing to do. And there's a variety of techniques that you can use for this. So it basically is just saying there is a well-established literature of how to do this. For a lot of theoretical mathematics, the goal is to come up with something entirely new. For a lot of applied mathematics, it's fine if something exists in the literature. The goal is to apply it in a meaningful way in a situation and get something that's worthwhile, that's valuable. All right, so now a number of researchers have utilized spatial modeling, so just goes through a bunch of people, and I'm not showing every paragraph in the paper, but just saying that stuff like this has been done. And then it ends with, despite this work, there's a dearth of research in the academic literature applying this to the United States. And you know, given that this is at a think tank in the United States, which is going to be advocating for certain policies in the United States, it would be useful to have such data for the US. 
That's a data. Uh, as of September 10th, the US had 6.3 million cases total, confirmed COVID cases, and 191,000 related deaths. So there is a word here that I am extremely happy that my student used. Anybody know what that word is? Related. Uh, which word? Related. Um, no. Related is actually one of the two words. I actually was so excited about a, uh, an earlier word, I didn't even see related. But I am happy about related uh, because a lot of people are counted as COVID deaths who maybe should not be, as well as there could be people who should be counted and are missed. But there's a word that made me very, very happy before related. Confirmed, right? I don't have to yell at my student. He put the word confirmed. Why is confirmed such an important word? Have COVID not know, go through it, become, be asymptomatic for the whole thing. And so if we're trying to estimate such numbers as your how, Quickly does it spread? How easy is it to catch? We need to know how many people. One of the best things you could do is choose certain towns and just test everyone. And I know they did this initially in some places in California, and I think some places in Italy, and we're shocked at how many more people had it than they thought. You know, right now for the people who are doing the metrics, this is one of the things that is extremely worrisome to me is, for the record, I love all the testing that Williams is doing, well done. But because there's so much testing, you're more likely not to catch cases. And so you have to take into account when you're assigning color codes to regions of the country that if you have more testing, there's a greater chance of finding more cases. So I love the fact that he used the next one, uh, almost nobody would catch, is I was shocked when I originally read to model the daily changes in cases across the 3,117 counties. I actually know that there's 3,141 counties in the United States. <laughs> Now, there's two reasons I know this. One is I actually do some work on Benefit's Law of Digit Bias, and we do a lot of county data. So I've seen county data for two decades. I know how many counties there are. The other one, 3,141, why might I remember that number? Hi, 3.14159. And so I was shocked to see, wait, he's missing some counties. And this is, oh, in the lower 48 states. Oh, okay. And for a lot of things, Alaska and Hawaii cause trouble. Do you think Alaska and Hawaii are similar to other states for COVID? No, why not? Isolated. Do you think Alaska might even be similar to island nations? Yeah, I, I might actually say you could almost view Alaska as an island, you know, for the purposes of the study. Okay, so they're going to look at what's going on in the county. We're going to utilize data on population density and income to assess the impact of these factors on disease spread. Now, this is really interesting. There are a lot of statistics or data that you would like, but you cannot always get. Uh, did I talk to this class about the dangers of watching TV when you're young? Okay, when my son was uh, very, very young, you know, we obviously, you know, watched a lot of good YouTube. We watched the Red Sox, we watched Sesame Street, we watched the Muppets. And then there was a study from some economists that if you watch TV or video or screen time before two, it increases your chance of becoming autistic, of just having some issues. What do you think my first thought is as a parent of a child who's under two? No screen time. But I'm also a mathematician, so what do you think my second thought is? How do they get the data? So we're going to play a little game. You can be, oh, I've got to be very careful not to insult my friends. You can be scientists. I use the word scientists. And you believe that watching TV increases your risk of autism. What data would you like to collect? You can wave your magic wand and I will give you whatever data you want. Yes. The percent of children that watch television, anything else you want? So you were able to do this in less than a minute. Impressive. That's not the data they collected. 
they collected rainfall and snow and precipitation. And the argument was that if it's raining or snowing, people are indoors. If people are indoors, you're more likely to be watching TV. And you know, it's, it's easy, it's fun to make light of what they're doing. Is it easy to get precipitation data? Absolutely. No. Without any trouble. It's much harder to get data on how much TV are the kids watching. And so the hope is that a lot of these variables are often related. And that if I measure this, that's really the same as measuring something else. But you sometimes have to delve deeply in the paper to see stuff like this. Uh, my friend and I used to volunteer for psychology experiments when we were in grad school. You know, there was money that allowed you to eat or go to a movie or something like that. And it's sometimes terrifying the data that's collected and the interpolations and interpretations that are made on it. This doesn't mean all such research is bad, but it means you've got to be very careful about what data is being found. And so what do you think income might correlate with that you might care about during our response in the lockdown? Good. So if you are lower income, then maybe you are more likely to have to go out. Maybe you have a job that's more likely to require you to physically go to work. Whereas if you're on the higher end of income, maybe you're more likely to be sending emails all day and you can work from home. So the question is, is this what they are doing? Is this what you want to gather? You really want to know how effective are different groups at isolating? How many contacts do they have? A lot of this can be done by tracking people through their phones. You know, uh, and so we will see some of that data later. But the question is, why do you think they are focusing on things such as uh, population density and income? Are there other things? So why do you think population density might be important? Okay, so greater population density means it's likely that you might have more contacts. You could have everybody in an apartment building and you basically stay in your apartment building and meals are delivered. And they're just left outside. But it's not unreasonable to expect that with a greater population density, there will be more interactions and more chance of spreading things. This is similar to the rabbit fox model we had. And the initial one, we didn't have any term that was related to the product of the populations. And then in the more advanced models, the left here, uh, I'll get them wrong, also just the predator prey equations, they actually included a term that was the product and said that this was a really good way to try to model how often the foxes get to see the rabbits. And so when we're doing the metrics, population density might be a really good thing to incorporate into the color code. You know, if you have a town that is five times the size of another town, maybe the same number of cases is not as bad in that town that's more spread out. Is there anything else you would like to see besides population density and income? Age of the population. Age of the population. So that might be a really good, so uh, people, whoever is saying stuff like this, please email me later. Um, age of the population would be terrific. Do you think all parts of the country have the same age distribution? So where do you think you have a very different age distribution than other places? Florida. Parts of Florida, right? So New England and New York is mostly concentrated in the northeast part of the country, but part of New England and New York actually is in Florida, where a lot of people retire and move down there. So you're going to have a lot of older people in certain areas. Uh, my parents retired to Tucson, Arizona. And again, you have a lot of people who are moving to places with better weather. So given how we now have data that the disease affects people with great differences. If you just look at age, it might be interesting to include an age distribution as well 
and that might be something that they should do before they send this out. Excellent. And then the hope is for a lot of things, you hope that ah, there's like the main term, there's the first correction term, and by the time you get to the second correction term, hopefully we can just ignore it. Okay, what else might you want to consider in addition to age? So, so, so another thing might be, you know, just because we have, you know, lockdowns, you know, lockdown can go in a tremendous range as to how strongly it's enforced. And that might be interesting to incorporate. Related to that might be how well people respond to voluntary versus mandatory requirements. You know, do different parts of the country respond differently to requests versus orders. And you know, these are things that might be worth including as well. Anything else? And again, if you think of other things, please let me know. And you know, this is your chance to help research that is ongoing right now. So incidents of mask wearing. And this is related to, to some extent, how well you follow things. Although it's interesting, different places have different rules about mask wearing. So I think we've talked multiple times that Spring Street, it's required for Williams students, and I think it's recommended for members of the community. Is it fair that we are forcing you to wear masks when we don't have to? So, okay, so I'm not gonna say students are a liability for the college because you know, we love you. Yeah. With, you're the reason we should, we should not be here without you. But you are right with the word liability, is there's a large number of students and you interact with each other probably more than a lot of adults interact with other adults in the community. And so there is a lot of concern in the community of what was gonna happen with all the Williams College students returning. And it turns out the numbers from Williams College students was essentially zero. Yeah. The fluctuations, you know, we had three, and I believe at least one of them was probably a false positive. You know, looking at how the tests are done. But uh, this great concern, and one of the advantages that the college has is you can take classes remotely. We have set up the college so you can do that. If the college wants to have strong policies, they can say, look, if you don't like it, don't come. It is much harder to do that at the town level where you might have to pass some laws. And it's been very interesting watching what the laws are coming from Massachusetts, from the governor's house, in terms of required, recommended, and how people are obeying stuff like that. Anything else that you might want to see here? So good, so accessibility to personal protective equipment. Right now, do you think it's pretty easy to get a mask? Yes. Today, yes. And at least in Williamstown, yes. But that's a great question as to how easy is it. I remember all the different things popping about how you can make your own mask. Uh, my daughter is doing a lot of rainbow looms. And I love it where it says, no, this rainbow loom mask will not provide COVID protection. <laughs> but you have to be careful in our litigious society to actually explicitly state, if you make a rainbow loom with elastic bands, don't expect it to protect you. When, Yes, yeah, so, so the comment was, you know, hand sanitizer and masks were hard to get in parts of Georgia. Right before COVID really started to hit, some of my students who were in China mailed me a bunch of masks. And, you know, I took a small number from my family and I gave the rest to the school district, to the police, to the fire department. You know, because you know, we didn't need that many masks, but, you know, they said, look, we have plenty of masks right now. We don't need this many, you know, can you use them? And you know, it was you know, a really nice gift to my in-laws. Oh, masks! <laughs> it was my second favorite pandemic moment. The other one was when I told one of my colleagues I got to take my mother-in-law to the supermarket. And he was so jealous that I got to go out to the supermarket with my mother-in-law. But the availability of masks and how well you can actually implement 
the various things. Uh, related to this would be looking at school districts. Do you, do you actually have the ability to do six feet separation? One of the nice things about the Berkshire is we've had a population decrease over the past few decades, and a lot of the buildings were designed for far more students. So for the elementary schools, we could actually bring the kids back and do six feet with masks. Unfortunately, we just finished new construction of the middle high school and really decreased the footprint of the building. And so you know, five years ago, we had all this extra space gone now. All right, so I'm going to continue, but these are outstanding things to add and to see, can you incorporate these in the model? Can these be used to explain some things? It might happen that the model becomes too complicated, but it's at least things worth considering. And so again, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do something like this today, is you are now participating in something that's going to be seen at the highest level. My uh, student has already testified before Congress on uh, climate data. And so he's somebody who has testified at the highest levels. And so you know, there's a chance that the comments you're making is going to help impact the national discussion, which I think is outstanding. Okay, next slide. So in order to understand people's behavioral response, uh, we utilize mobility data provided by Google. It's always a little troublesome as to exactly how much data is available on you. Uh, and so they were able to aggregate county by county time series data of mobility to retail restaurants, grocery stores, pharmacies, public parks, workplaces, and within residences with respect to a baseline movement level. Is there a question? Okay. So here is the United States broken into four census regions. You have Northeast, the South, the Midwest, and the West. Anybody have any concerns about this map? Um, the West is kind of large. Yep. Um, yeah, but only in terms of geography, not in terms of number of states. Right, but it should be, it's like the Midwest, I was thinking more Colorado should be like, I don't know why they're the West. It's also just like not split evenly. So it's not split evenly, but there's something that concerns me when I look at this. Alaska and Hawaii don't have a region. Alaska and Hawaii! Yeah, but they don't count. What That's census funny. region is Alaska and Hawaii? I'm not sure. I'm sorry? Guam, Puerto Rico. And so I believe this is only doing the states, but you're right that there's also uh, territories in the United States. And how are those included? I mean, he mentioned that they're only including the lower 48 states in the paper. So in parts of the paper, they're only doing the lower 48, but if this is a map of the census regions, I would like to know what region Alaska, Hawaii, as well as Puerto Rico, uh, Guam, and some other places are. And so, you know, if anybody's keeping notes, that's a good thing to just, you know, alert me to, to ask him about. Mm -hmm. So here's population density across the United States county by county. Uh, you know, if you look at this, it's not so surprising. You can see, you know, huge density in the Northeast, parts of the Midwest. Most of the West is, you know, very empty until you get to the West Coast again. All right, median household income. Does this look reasonable? The highest income seems to be in this like stretch up, you know, 95, you know, going from like the DC area almost up to the Boston area. You have a lot of West Coast of California. You can probably tell where some of the interesting cities are. Do you like the idea that it's using median? Can somebody tell me what median means? Yes, 50th percentile, half hour above, half hour below. That's a much better thing in some sense to look at than the mean or the average household income. Because you know, if you know, Bill and Melinda Gates move into your community, for the most part, it really doesn't matter who else lives there. All that matters is just how many people and that will you know, give you your new average income. 
All right, so here is confirmed COVID cases, May 1st, 2020, and then August 21st, 2020. And it's, you know, looking at some kind of density plot as to exactly where they are. And again, you see, you know, again, a lot in the Northeast over here in that same corridor, West Coast, California, various other parts of the country, you know, expanding out a little bit more. Uh, this is from a different paper that he wrote, just zooming in on two different parts of the country and just seeing some of the data as to just you know, how many cases. Uh, and this was April 12th. Oops, okay. Google Mobility Trends, Franklin County, Ohio. So he chose two counties, Franklin County and Manhattan. I'm going to just assume everybody knows where Manhattan is. Franklin County is actually where Columbus is in Ohio. So I actually lived there for a year when I was a postdoc at Ohio State. And he's looking at uh, a couple of variables, residential, grocery, retail, workplace, parks, and transit, and seeing the percent change in movement with respect to the baseline. So not surprisingly, you know, before the lockdown, before the pandemic starts, everybody's at 0% because you're just doing what's normal. And then there's a huge spike upwards in parks, down in workplace, down in transit, down in retail, down in grocery. Other than grocery, does eventually climb back up, and it's not so much. It's not down so much in the end. And then you have residential. Does this plot pass the smell test? Does this surprise you? believe that this is reasonable data? Do you think that it's reasonable that park usage went up during the lockdown or in the time after the lockdown? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you know, it seems like there's not that many places you can go that would seem safe. You're know, big park outdoors where you can be socially distant from people. You know, you're going stir crazy. Seems like a reasonable thing. You know, transit. Seems quite reasonable that that would go down as people are not commuting as much. People might be very worried about getting on a bus, or you know, I know, you know, I don't think we have a massive subway system in Franklin County, but you will see Manhattan in the moment. You see a lot of people having concerns about going in the subway. So if you look at these, these numbers are reasonable, but if you're from Google mobility trend, and you always want to question the source. So what might Google be missing? All the people who don't have smartphones, which All is probably not that big. So I resisted getting a smartphone, or actually getting a cell phone, because uh, until my wife was pregnant. At that point, then I had to have a cell phone. And I remember a few years ago, my daughter wanted a cell phone, and she asked my wife. And you know, my wife said no. And she was, well, how old were you, mom, when you got your cell phone? And her jaw dropped. And my wife said, and if you think that's bad, ask dad when he got his. So completely, completely different time now. I mean, when I was in college, you had to physically go and request an email address. It was not automatic. So the question is, how many people now have a smartphone? You know, would you say for college students, it's over 95%? Over 98%? For smartphones, I would say probably over 98%. And then it becomes interesting as you go down and down and down in age. You know, I, I know five-year-olds who have smartphones. I was having my car serviced years ago in the Boston area, and there was a four-year-old who told me how he and his younger brother prefer their coffee, and he was serious. He then went and made his coffee. <laughs> and so, you know, you have to be careful. There are going to be a variety of people who will be a little bit non-standard. But the question is, will most people be captured in something like this? Or if they're not going to be captured, will they be captured by someone else? So how might you capture really young kids? In terms of data purposes, not capturing kids to sell them or do anything illicit with them. How might you capture the kids?
Hopefully they're always with their parents or guardian. You know, hopefully you don't have gangs of your three-year-olds, you know, going down the streets of Franklin County looking to run them. And so little kids are almost surely going to be with their parents, a nanny, a family member, a sibling, something like that. But you may not know when a parent is out or a guardian is out if they have the kids with them. So one question I might ask about this is to provide a little bit more detail. And again, if somebody can just send me some notes about this, about exactly how are you capturing people? Are you capturing, say, certain age groups with high confidence and other age groups you're just trying to test? Next one is Manhattan. Does that look different from Franklin County? Very different. Why do you think Manhattan might be so different from Franklin County? So policy might be more strict in Manhattan. Any reason why the policy might be more strict? I'm sorry? Well, so interestingly, uh, the population is 1.629 million approximately in Manhattan, uh, 1.317 million in Franklin, so comparable. Uh, the area is in density. I mean, but it's a much shorter, much more compact. You know, the land area was 22.8 square miles, whereas Franklin County was 544. So, oops. When you go from 22, to 544, you're multiplying by more than a factor of 20. And so if you take the square root of that, you know, you're talking about maybe a factor of five, so maybe a 20, 25 Manhattan's fitting in, in terms of just how spread out things are. But what else is very different about Manhattan from Franklin County? There's a huge drop in parks. There's a huge drop in what? Parks. I can't hear. Parks. Parks, yeah, there's a huge drop in parks. But why do you think there's such a different behavior in Manhattan than Franklin County. Manhattan only has one park. So Manhattan has one major park, Central Park. Um, I, I walked it from end to end. It was a beautiful walk. I could not believe I was in New York City as I walked through it. But think back, what was different about maybe Manhattan than in Franklin County? They had an outbreak, right? There was a massive outbreak and a lot of people dying in New York City. And so it's not surprising that maybe the policy could be very different. And so when I'm seeing two plots like this, am I surprised that there's such a difference? No, because I know that there was a very different game on the ground. The fact that the parks is so decreased, uh, it could be, well, how much accessibility do you have to parks in New York City? And if they close down Central Park, what other options do you have? If you go to a park in another county, does that no longer count? So you know, just you know, things to think about. All right. So this is the mathematical model. You know, we are not going to go into this in detail, but you know, he says, you know, I've got my Poissonian random variables, where my parameters the log of something else. I have linear models for this. I have all these different things coming into play. Right. And so the elements were operationalized by compiling information on longitude and latitude of each county's centroid and calculating the Euclidean distance between the county states or the centers of the county. And then we're assuming that the geographic influence of neighboring counties decays exponentially with distance. So there's a lot going on here. Do you like using the Euclidean distance? So the Euclidean distance, if I have two points, I draw the line connecting them, and I calculate the length of the line. So we already calculate the length of the line using Pythagoras. You know, a squared plus b squared is c squared for right time. So if I move over, you know, five, uh, say four units east and three units north, then the hypotenuse is going to be five because three squared plus four squared is five. So using the Euclidean distance. All right, so if you look um, at gerrymandered congressional districts, uh, congressional districts are often different than counties. And this goes back to George Jerry, former governor of Massachusetts from you know, around 1800. You can have some very strange shapes. So the question is, is the 
countries, centroid, the right thing to look at? It's not terrible. And the hope is that most counties are actually nice geographically. It's only congressional districts that are butchered. But why might I be concerned about using Euclidean distance, the straight line connecting them? Might not be a little bit. It's, it's more than just they might not be a road. If you want to look at the straight line distance from Boston to Los Angeles, you do the straight line connecting them, what would you be doing? So you'd be tunneling through the earth. Now, if the earth curvature isn't too large, you know, anything close to you, the difference from being on the sphere to being straight through the earth, not a huge deal. And in fact, we even talked about an article by Isaac Asimov on this, that over small regions, the curvature isn't so bad. And if things are exponentially decaying, it doesn't matter if we're not using the distance on the sphere versus the distance, because we're so far away now that the impact is negligible. There's an old joke, um, you know, Carl Sagan is giving a talk, and he is discussing the instability of the sun, and says that in about 5 billion years, the sun is going to explode. And somebody goes, wait, what, what did you say? And you, you can see this look of horror and fright on his face. And Carl Sagan said, in about five billion years, the Earth's sun will explode. Oh, thank God. I thought you said million. And again, it doesn't really matter if it's five million or five billion. It is so far down the road that the difference between million and billion for anything we're considering does not matter. And so you might say for something like this, if we have an exponential decay, I'm quite happy with just using the easy to calculate. But it's so easy, of course, to just calculate the distance on a sphere. Maybe you should use that as well, because it's not that hard to do. You just tell your computer, hey, use this formula for geometry. Do you think that the right way to look at the spatial correlations between two counties is through their distance. I will give an example, another example from Isaac Asimov from one of his favorite stories, The Ugly Little Boy. Anybody familiar with the story? So time travel is invented. But you can only go back very far in time. You can't go back very short in time. And they asked these scientists, this makes absolutely no sense. And so the example he says, and I think everybody can do this, is take your right hand and touch your right shoulder. Great job, everyone. Wonderful, OK? I'm going to give you something that's much easier. You will get an A plus if you can do this. Take your right hand and touch your right elbow. It's only half the distance. That should be much easier to do. Do you think that the right way to measure how close two cities are is the distance? It should be how they interact with each other. How they interact with each other. That's a much better statistic. So how would you determine maybe which cities interact, depending on if you have mountains or whatnot? Uh, my wife's parents have a place in Lenox, which is about 45 minutes south of us here. We visit them, uh, and we were coming back one weekend, and there was an accident on Route 7. And the question is, how long are we going to be here? And so eventually, I went out of the car, and I walked all the way to the front. And eventually, you know, I talked to a policeman who was kind enough to tell me to turn around. And eventually, they sent police cars to basically just tell everybody to turn around and to push them far back. The problem is, you've got Route 7 going north-south, and we were in a stretch of Route 7 where there's no roads east or west. And the best way to get home was to go all the way south, then eventually hook to the west, and eventually hook back up. And so depending on how things are, I'm not convinced that the distance is the best metric. But it's an easy metric to use. It's very easy to calculate how close two cities are. Oh, this quarter, this quarter, boom, done. How do you discuss how cities interact. Well, it's maybe worth considering. What's 
What do you think Williamstown might interact with most in this general area? Pittsfield, maybe North Adams. There's another one. Bennington, but there's another one. Albany. When you look at all the people who travel. So Albany is much further from Williamstown than a lot of the Dickie towns in between. And in fairness to the Dickie towns, you can also consider us as Dickie towns. You know, I know a lot of these towns because my kids have played games against you know, teams from those areas. But Albany is much further away than a lot of the towns on the way, where we would have almost no interaction with those towns in between, but we would have interactions with Albany. And so maybe you should look at something, something related to maybe nearest airport and take something like that into account. And again, I, I'm saying these things, you know, I, I think this is a fine model. I think there's a lot of good stuff that's being done here but I just want you to get a sense of how you look at things and the kinds of questions you ask. And um, the model estimation results, you know, we're running out of time. So uh, notable results, the marginal posterior distributions are unimodal. In most of the regions, the mobility exhibits some correlations with each other with the highest degree correlation occurring in the Southern census region. I'm going into a little bit more detail, uh, talking about you know, some of the values of the you know, constants and a little bit of effect of different regions of the country behaving differently. Uh, at the end of the day, they actually say that when you do the analysis, there is some explanatory power provided by taking into account spatial connectedness or closeness. And then there's some you know, policy implications of this. And just you know, some of the counterintuitive results about you know, staying home, uh, going to the parks and whatnot. And then, of course, you have to wonder how have these things changed now versus when things started. So now that masks are more available, now that hand sanitizer is more available, I am the you know, second coach of my son's baseball team. And the very first thing I did was I bought three giant tubs of hand sanitizer. I thought they were going to be good coaches. And this way, each one of us, every day, would be traveling with a hand sanitizer that would be enough to basically cover everybody who came. So that if one of us doesn't show or two of us doesn't show, there's still somebody there who has it. Now you can get the hand sanitizer you know, very easily. Okay, so anyways, that's what I wanted to you know, essentially cover for today was to give you a sense of how do you read a paper critically. It's also much easier when you're the one who doesn't have to do the follow-up work. Because, you know, I will contact my colleague and say, all right, this is what I think you might want to look at. I'll wait for all of your emails and say, this is what my students have suggested as well. And it would be wonderful to see, can you incorporate some of these? And does this increase the model's predictive power? Or is it going to require so much data that we just don't have? It? You know, we can't just wave our wand and get every data set that we want. What can we do with the data that's available? And I will end with the following warning. In a lot of psychology studies, what do you think is the most commonly used population? College students. So you are interpolating or extracting from college students how the general population behaves. I'll let you think about that. All right, have a good day all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.